That is a great song, man. God. Wish I could sing, write songs like that. I guess I could, but probably not that anytime soon. Amen to that, you know? It's not my gift. Good to be here this morning. Yes. We've gotten a lot of good stuff already this morning. We got, we still have, I still get, is this for me, John, the stress management for dummies? Well, he left that up here for me. Amen. So I can keep this for myself. Another gift, a little stocking stuffer for me up here, amen. But that was a great reminder. Jesus, do not be troubled, right? We can trust him. He's very trustworthy, and God the Father is very trustworthy. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted all of us to turn to, uh, to Isaiah because uh, I've actually been studying uh, Isaiah for the last few months, just taking my time. Uh, Going slow, a couple chapters, sometimes only a chapter a day or sometimes half a chapter. Just taking my time and the guys in my family group, every now and then I'll shoot them a text. Hey, this is what I've been studying or this is what I learned. I just, don't you know, sometimes you just have to slow down and just take things in. And uh, as you know, this time of year, there are some passages in Isaiah that get read frequently. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, right? Verse 14. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. We'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Chase read from uh, the New Testament referencing this passage in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 is familiar this time of year. For to us a child is born, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. These are passages that are really encouraging to us this time of year. But I do think we must remember that these were written or recorded 700 years before Jesus was even born. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, you may not have even realized that. And so the original hearers of Isaiah saying this or writing this, the, the people that originally received this didn't know who exactly was being referred to. It was a mystery. It was, they were, this was just another clue that God had given ahead of time so that it would produce trust, I believe, in us that his word is trustworthy. 700 years before Jesus is even born, this was written about him. Child born of a virgin, fulfilling God's desire to be with his people. A child called God and father, uh, prince of peace, counselor. These are all Christian themes that resonate with us, that inspire us. And I just want to encourage you, some of us have a Old Testament phobia or something. It's like we don't even, we, we, it's like a disorder. We don't even want to go there. You know, we just don't go there. And I just want to encourage you, hey, open up the whole Bible. I just want, this isn't part of the message, but I just feel compelled to say it. The Old Testament is part of the Bible. Pick it up. Read it. Jesus is in there too. We just see. See, you can find Jesus even in the Old Testament. Here we are coming up on a brand new year. Why don't you challenge yourself? Pick, you pick a, a book of the Old Testament. Learn it a little more than you've ever learned it before. There's many, there are many free, free, did you, free, which is awesome in our budget, right, this time of year. There are many free study guides that you can go online and look, look up if you get confused. But please open up the Old Testament. Learn some things about, even about Jesus. Yes, it is possible. And honestly, it is inspiring. And uh, those, are the, those aren't the only two passages, Isaiah 7 and 9, that talk about Jesus in Isaiah. And so today's message actually has come from my three months of just being in Isaiah. I just figured, hey, if I've been in there, I might as well preach from it. And plus, it's Christmas, and I was trying to spend some time with my family as well. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, it kind of worked out for everybody, did it not? But, but, but honestly, it, 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 it's so helpful it has built my faith in the reliability of God's word and in the consistency of his plan that has been unfolding over time. 
And if 700 years before Jesus was born, these types of things were written, what about what's going on right now in 2015, about to be 2016? Do you feel a part of what God is trying to do in this world? Or is that just stuff you kind of read about in the Bible and it's just kind of old or whatever? Or have, have you forgotten that? Wait a minute. We're still living out. God's still doing things now. God, God isn't asleep. We don't just read about what he did before and, oh, yeah, that, then the New Testament comes along and, oh, yeah, Revelation. There are things going on right now. But you know what? We may not know all the clues yet. We may not be able to figure it all out. But God has not stopped the outworking of his plan. We actually have a role in it, which is powerful and encouraging. But today I want to look at Jesus. I want to focus in on Jesus today and what he looks like in a few examples, a few chapters in Isaiah's incredible, incredible book. So let's go to God in prayer and let's see what he provides us today about Jesus from the book of Isaiah. Father, we pray to you this morning wanting to draw near to you. We are grateful that we can get deeper with you and that you do want to be with us and you've proven that with Jesus coming to, to live among us and to, to die for us, to, to bring the Holy Spirit here to be among us and even to dwell within us. Father, you have proven over and over again you are trustworthy, you are with us, you want to be with us. You are willing to forgive us of our sins. Father, we are so grateful for that. And I pray this morning as we look in Isaiah this morning that we can be encouraged to see how you have always had a plan to bring people close to you. Even in the midst of despair, Father, there's always hope if we look to you. What an incredible message that we can learn. And Father, I pray that as we read about Jesus and as we understand more about his character, the attributes of his heart, I pray that we're not just here just to listen or just to be spectators. I pray that we can take some of these character traits and imitate them in our own lives and pray for them to be manifest in the way we live our lives today in the here and now. Father, help us this morning as we humble ourselves and try to be contrite as we read your word. Pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. In Isaiah, there are four, and some people say five, what they call servant songs. And these are, Christians, we believe that these are actual occurrences that talk about Jesus as the servant, and he is a, has unique characteristics that God has, wants to use him for to uh, have his purposes known throughout the world. And there are, again, I say four of them. Some people say there's a fifth one, and we'll talk about that later. But I only want to really, really focus in on two of these servant songs. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework to read the other ones, and then at the very end, I'm going to show you how they can be relevant to us, even today, to produce faith. But I want to start out in Isaiah chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break Amen. and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. This is what God, the Lord, says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. 
See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. What can we learn about Jesus and what can help us even in our own faith today? Well, I believe here is my servant. That word servant, that's a good place to start. We're going to talk a lot about that in the upcoming new year in January. But I think we got to be grateful for this concept that Jesus really was to be a servant of God. But, you know, a servant implies that there's a master and someone who serves him, right? God as the, as the master, Jesus the servant. But, you know, here's the deal. A, a great master will uphold and take care of their servants, right? And it's encouraging to know that God is not a taskmaster, but a master who upholds his servant. And then he says that he delights in his servant. And this is something that a lot of us struggle with. We think we have to be perfect in order to have God delight in us. But you know what? God delights in you and me even before we can do one good thing. That's the great thing about God, the grace of God. You don't have to earn his delight. Look, God, I've done a lot of great things this week. Are you going to like me more than you did last week? That's how we are. That's how so many of us are. God delights in us. You know why? Because that's his nature and his character. His character is so amazing and incredible, he does delight in us. Now, does he expect us to live a certain way, to live as a servant, and to follow him and to love him and to love others? Absolutely, he does. But we don't have to earn his delight. He delights in his servant, this specific servant, we believe, talking about Jesus. And I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. You know, Matthew talks about this in Matthew 3. He cites this passage, but I'm grateful that God puts his spirit on Jesus. And that's where the justice will come from for all the nations. Isn't that encouraging? We search for justice all kind of ways, right? Don't we? I mean, we just think it's going to, we need to get this particular uh, political party in office so we can get this type of person on the Supreme Court, and then we'll get justice in this country. Okay, all right. Good luck. You know what I'm saying? I'm not waiting on that one. Do you know what I mean? Oh, if we, what about socialism or democracy or what about Sharia law? No, I'm not waiting on any of that either. I'm waiting on Jesus to bring justice here to the nations, not to just Israel, not to just America, to the nations. You know, God's had a plan for all people, not just Israel, not just America, for all people. He will bring justice because of the Spirit of God. I wait. I don't think I can, I don't mete out perfect justice in my life, do you? I don't. I struggle with that myself. I look to God. I'm grateful for this servant that he's referring to. He's the one that will bring justice to the nations. But how's he going to do it? We know one thing. He's not going to get out there and shout about it. He's not going to cry out. He's not going to raise his voice in the streets. What is he getting at? I think what he's getting at is the nature of Jesus. You know, when you think about Jesus, you think about his, 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 his demeanor. He wasn't this self-assertive guy. He was unaggressive in many ways. You know, I, I don't think he was out to startle people. He, he wasn't out just to, to dominate and shut people down. That's not how he lived his life. He wasn't out to, to advertise himself. Look at me. Oftentimes, Jesus would do stuff and say, don't tell anybody. Don't, don't, even, don't even mention me. That's the nature of Jesus. And we see, we see this written about him even before he was born. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Wow, don't, a bruised reed. Anybody ever feel like a bruised reed? You know what I'm saying? Just bruised. You know what I mean? Just tender. Just not, not feeling strong in that area, right? Just bruised. Or, or, or just a smoldering wick. I mean, sometimes, isn't that your spiritual life? Some, sometimes, doesn't that just describe your spiritual life? I mean, you, your, your lamp is just, the, 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 the flame is just barely there. You know what I mean? You, is, is it on? Is it, is it lighted, you know? That, that, don't you sometimes feel that way? I mean, who just wakes up every morning just a flame of faith? You know what I mean? I'm a flame of faith today. Amen. I don't always wake up that way, right? Sometimes I'm feeling bruised from within. Sometimes I, I need some more external help to, to light my flame. I mean, isn't it encouraging to know that this, this servant that Isaiah was talking about 
What's his nature? He's not domineering. He's not overbearing. He's not crying out, shutting people down, telling them, forcing them. And if you're bruised, if you're barely holding on, he's not there to just snuff you out. That's not the heart of this servant that Isaiah is talking about. What an encouragement. That, that just brings me so much encouragement. In a world that just seems to some people just take pride in breaking bro- bruised reeds and snuffing out flames that aren't doing so great. Seems like some people just enjoy that. But not this servant that Isaiah is talking about. I say amen to that. You know, in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice, and he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. Man, Jesus had a lot of reasons to be discouraged. A lot. Wow, but he didn't. He didn't let it take him off his plan to live out the role that God had for him. How about you? Anybody get discouraged? I mean, we do get discouraged. I'm sorry. We're sheep, okay? That's who we are. We, we do get discouraged. But here's the deal. Do you allow your discouragement to take you off of the plan that God has for your life? You know, and I, and I do think that that's one of the things we got to really continue to, to work on in our lives. Sometimes I think we just get this false idea that just everything should just be all right all the time. That's just not the case. It wasn't for the servant. There were reasons for him to be discouraged. But he didn't falter. He didn't quit. He kept on the plan. That's encouraging to me. And then it kind of switches when you see this in verse 5. This is what God the Lord says. Oh, okay, what God? Oh, you want to know which one? Oh, the one who created the heavens, stretched them out, spread out the earth, all that comes out of it, gives breath to his people, and life to those who walk on it. That's the one we're talking about. I love when, I love it. I love when God does this in the Bible. He just clarifies it. Sometimes, is, did, did an impersonal explosion happen and, like, create everything that we see and, like, the ooze kind of oozed together with some more ooze, and then it like, it oozed perfectly and kind of created stuff. And then the stuff like started growing eyes and legs and hearts and everything. And that, and that was, it's just impersonal. It just happened. It just, bloosh, it just it, it, wow, over time. And that's just how things came into being. When you read Isaiah over and over and over again, I am God. I created for a reason. I'm behind it. There's a reason that there's this earth. You need to figure it out. Look up. You see the heavens. Look down. You see the earth. Look in the mirror and look in your heart. That's how you know that there's a God. He created it all. And I love when he reminds us over and over and over again. And then I think about Jesus. I I think about his earthly life. You know, he's going through tough times. People, his best friends are just not listening to a word he says. He's struggling. I almost, I wonder if if Jesus, when he was here on earth, would refer to the next part that we're about to read when he was going through a tough time. I, the Lord, verse 6, have called you in righteousness, and I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. If that were me, if I believe Jesus would have got a lot of encouragement from that. And I believe we can get encouragement from this message as well. That we can be encouraged that God will take hold of our hand, even in the midst of discouraging times. And I appreciate the fact that God always had a plan for the, for the other nations outside of Israel. This was something that Israel just kept missing the point. They kept thinking that every blessing would seem to be only for them. But God's plan was always for all nations to be able to be right with him. And that's how we can be sitting here today confident that we are right with God. To open the eyes of the blind, free captives from prison, release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. This has always been the plan of Jesus. Miraculous healings, physical and spiritual. And this is who he is. He will not give his glory to another. I appreciate that. People try to take the glory from God, but he's not going to let it happen. He will not let it happen. And what I appreciate is he says that he says things that are, that are going to happen even before they come into being. Another reason that we can have trust 
in this God. This servant, filled with the Spirit, bringing justice, not overbearing, very gracious and kind and gentle, yet very resilient, straight from God, a covenant for the people, not just Israel, but for all of mankind, who frees people from the darkness, brings them into the light, and breaks the chains that bind them. 700 years before Jesus was even born, this, to me, can provide us much encouragement if we allow it. And let's go to Isaiah chapter 50 for the last one I want to look at today. Isaiah chapter 50, another servant song of Isaiah. We'll pick it up in verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It's the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment, and the moths will eat them up. Some of us didn't even know this was in the Bible. You know, I appreciate that he says the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. Doesn't that remind you of Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. I mean, what an incredible reminder of who Jesus is. He has an instructed tongue. But where did he get that instructed tongue? Where did he get it from? Morning by morning, he spent time with God. Morning after morning, he spent time with God. Doesn't that remind you of something? Mark 135, right? Just was, that was his custom, to go out and spend time with God. While it was still dark, he would go out and spend time in prayer with God. If this is who Jesus is described as, man, this should be us. I mean, I hope we can have a, 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 an instructed tongue, something helpful to say to the weary, but we won't if we're just in our own wisdom. We got to spend time with God. We got to spend time morning by morning. What a, what a humble heart. Jesus, so humble. Jesus was the word in the flesh, but he still spent time talking to God, learning from God's word. We, some of us are spending too much time in front of the TV, too much time doing this and not spending time in God's word. Giving him our time, giving him our heart. Man, turn the cotton picking phone off, man. We all need to do that. But man, I tell you, sometimes it just seems like it's just speaking at us. Listen to me. Touch these buttons, please. Talk to somebody you don't need to talk to. Buy something. Check your email. Stop. You don't need to do that. Turn it off. Spend time with God morning by morning. Get that instruction from God. And then you can have an instructed tongue to help this weary, weary world. Christians, we're too distracted by other things, and we're not morning by morning listening to what God is trying to teach us. If you got a New Year's resolution, make that it. Spend more time with God. How do I do it, Jeff? I don't know, but here's what you don't do. Don't look at TV and don't look at your phone and figure it out. That's what I would say. Start there. Because if not, then you know what? We have a tendency to stray and to look to other things instead of God. But see, this servant here in verse 5 said he wasn't rebellious. Even though Israel as a nation was often rebellious, like you and I are individually, they would get the word from God and they would want to do right, but then some other God over here, they start worshiping some other God, and then God is just, the, he's like, what in the world do I need to do with these people? They would be rebellious. But here, right here, not in verse 5, right? I have not been rebellious, not, not this servant. In fact, he says, I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me. 
Does that sound familiar if you're a Christian? What is the word I offered my back? What does that mean to you? I offered it. Willingly, voluntarily, I offered my back. I wasn't forced to do it. I offered my back to those who beat me. And then we find out a little information that we don't necessarily read about in the Gospels that they pull his beard, right? We don't necessarily, it's almost like Isaiah is a gospel writer in this little part, talking about what happened to Jesus as he was being crucified. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting 700 years before these events happened. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Wait a minute. How, what do you mean the sovereign Lord helps you? I thought you were getting beat up. You are a disgrace. Somebody spit in your face, that's a disgrace. How, how, how can you talk about God helping you when you're getting beat up because of your faith? Now, you should be mad at God, right? You should be questioning God. You should be saying how unfair things are, how you were obedient, you weren't rebellious, but yet you're getting beat up. You're getting mocked and spat upon. Aren't you supposed to denounce your faith and denounce God and say he's not there or he's not real or he's impotent? Isn't that what we're supposed to do when we suffer? When we say we believe in God but life deals us injustice, aren't we supposed to tell God how wrong he is? Isn't that, isn't that, the, isn't that the natural thing a person should do? Nah, not according to this, right? Not according to this servant. This is the mindset of the servant Isaiah talks about, who we believe is Jesus. This was his mindset. You know what? God does help me, and I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint. That reminds me of Luke 9, 51, right? Resolutely set out for Jerusalem. You know, there's two types of courage I read somewhere. There's courage of the moment. You know what I'm saying? Car accident, you're in the car, you see the baby and you just you don't think you just get out you run pull the baby out right Th that, that's courage but it's kind of like it's just in the moment you just you just make it happen but then there's another type of courage there's courage when you know what's going to go down you know what's going to happen and you still go straight down that road and to me that's the kind of courage that Jesus exhibited he knew the agony that he was going to face on that cross he knew every nail was going to, every, every ounce of pain that he was going to feel. He knew it before, and he still kept going. Set his face like flint. Resol I will not be deterred from what God wants me to do with my life. Why would he do that? Well, he was a servant of God, and he took faith from God, and he knew God held his hand, and he knew ultimately Verse 8, that he who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Who's my accuser? Right? It's the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? Man, that sounds like Romans 8 to me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Right. Romans chapter 8, right? There is no condemnation in Christ, right? Where does Paul get that stuff? He doesn't just make it up out of nowhere, right? The Bible is connected. This is in the Old Testament. Get rid of your Old Testament of phobia. It's good stuff in here. You can learn about Jesus. And then I wasn't going to read this, but since John read about trust in uh, his communion, I said, I'll read this part, which technically isn't necessarily a part of the song itself. But in verse 10, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Okay, let's switch it up a little bit. Okay, look, listen to all this stuff. He's not rebellious. He won't, even if in, in the face of beat, getting beat down and everything, he won't turn away. Okay, what, he, he's in his, he listens to God. He gets an instructed tongue from it. He spends time with God. Okay, well, who's going to fear the Lord and obey the word of the servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Who walks in the dark? You need a light, don't you? What's your light going to be? How are you going to know where to go with your life? You got to trust in God. God, you're going to show me the way to go. How are you going to show me? You're going to show me from your word. You're going to show me from your people. You're going to give me your Holy Spirit. I, 
I'm not going to be able to explain it with a formula, but I, I, I can be assured if I follow the principle, the precepts of, of your word, if I trust in you and the plan that you have set down, then that will be the light for my life. I'm going to rely on you to give me direction how to make decisions, who I should marry, how I raise my kids, how I spend my money, how I talk to people that I know, how I meet strangers, how I, I devote myself to who I devote myself to. Those are the decisions I'm going to let you teach me. That's what I need to do. But what about the person, verse 11, but now all you who light fires and provide yourself with flaming torches, go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches that you have set ablaze. See, there's a type of light that you can manufacture on your own. I don't need the word. I don't need morning by morning to be instructed by God. I can skip 10, 12, 15 mornings out of the next 20. I'm good. I I don't need prayer to help God. Prayer, what's that? I mean, it's just talking to the ceiling. My mom, my dad raised me good. I got good morals. I got good principles. That's the light that I'm going to use. That is my light to guide me through all the decision-making in my life. And I'll read some great books by some people I see on Oprah and all that good stuff, and sooner or later, everything's going to work out. That's the light that I'm going to go by. That is how I'm going to guide myself through life. Okay, well, that's your choice. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. We all have a choice. Which light do you want to live your life by? The light that comes from God or the light that you manufacture for yourself? The choice is yours. I'm going to give you some homework. You ready? Write it down. Type it into your phone, whatever. Even though I told you to turn it off, I guess you can turn it back on. (laughs) So for your homework, you can read Isaiah 49. One through seven, all right? That's, that's some homework for you, all right? And, I, and I'm going to give you some more homework. This is, the, this is the, the, the song with an asterisk to it. Some say it's not a servant song because the actual word servant is not in it. But when you read it, it'll be familiar to you. And that's Isaiah 61, one through three. I want to close out because why are we looking in the Old Testament? It's not as fun. Okay, well, let's look in the book of Acts, Amen. Okay, I'm just people pleasing. All right, okay. You know, you're not as into this. Okay, that's cool. Let's go to Acts. That's cool. We'll read Book of Acts. All right. Everybody likes the Book of Acts. Philippians, right? I mean, you just can't go wrong. Anywhere in John, right? In the Gospels, right? All right. Tired of this Old Testament stuff, Jeff. It's, it's outdated. It doesn't really affect us in our daily life. Isaiah, who cares about Isaiah? I want New Testament stuff. All right, I'm going to give it to you right now. (laughs) Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or somebody else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. 
And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Why did I read that? Exhibit A that the Holy Scriptures from Isaiah can help you today. And this is another, this is another of the servant songs of Isaiah. Beginning in Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. And that's some more homework for you. But do you notice the power of Old Testament Scripture? That was the starting point for this person to come to faith in Jesus. He didn't know. Who is he talking about? I don't know who he's talking about. Please help me. Because once you understand who God's been talking about and you understand it's Jesus, then your faith gets built stronger and stronger and stronger. So I just want to charge you and encourage you. Read these Isaiah servant songs. And I want you to make your decisions. What types of character traits do you want to take from this servant Jesus and implement in your life in 2016? Choose a couple of them and share them with your friends. Share them with God. Let us become more like the servant that has been written about in Scripture so that we can go out with an instructed tongue, so that we have words for the weary for people who are confused and trying to figure things out. And when God's Spirit moves us to speak to them, whether it's from the book of John or the book of Isaiah, we can lead them to faith in Jesus. But if we don't take to heart what God has been doing, what God has been showing us about Jesus, then we can't be effective. So let's hold out God's Word. Let's internalize these servant songs of Isaiah. And in January, come back because we're going to talk more about what it means to be a servant of the living God. Amen? Amen. All right. Happy New Year.